morning, everybody, and welcome to day 32 of Remote Learning and Civics. Today, we're going to be reviewing the types of law and the trial process of a few amazing individuals with me today that are going to ask some good questions and partake in some questions and other activities to review the content and material. So make sure you have your notes out and let's get started here. So I told you that the judicial branch has two main parts to it. Part one of the judicial branch was Article 3. So we read all about what the Constitution had to say about the judicial branch. And then part two is law, trials, and courts. Now, I kind of shortened up this section um, so that we could get through it in a couple weeks because we only have a couple of weeks left of school. Um, so for law, uh, typically we talk about historical sources of law, modern sources of law, um, and various different types of law. But I wanted to shorten it up and just talk about the two main types of law. Usually when we're talking about court cases or we're talking about law, we're talking about either criminal law or civil law. But again, there are numerous different types of law. Uh, we could talk about juvenile law. That would be about you guys, kids, um, minors under the age of 18. So things like, you know, you guys are required to go to school. You guys uh, have curfews. Technically, you're supposed to be in at a certain time. You know, can't be roaming the streets at 2 a.m. You know, I'm sure you guys do it with your friends on the weekends. But uh, so there's various types of laws. We're just focusing on the two main types of laws. Uh, the first main type of law that most people probably think of is criminal law. So criminal law, I mean, if you think about the word criminal, um, it comes from the word crime. And basically, criminal law deals with anybody that commits a crime. So somebody that, that breaks a law. So a couple of my pictures up here, um, you see people in handcuffs, this person in an orange jumpsuit um, means that they are uh, they're uh, an inmate, that they're arrested. If you get arrested for breaking a law, if you commit a crime, this is criminal law. And there are a few different categories of crimes. First, we have felonies. Felonies are more serious crimes. These would be things like grand theft, so stealing things worth a large amount of money, um, you know, murder, obviously, um, battery or abuse or physical abuse, you know, punching somebody in the face uh, could be a felony. And then our less serious crimes are known as misdemeanors. A misdemeanor would be maybe petty theft, um, you know, stealing something that's um, worth in, well, in Florida, petty theft would be under $100. So stealing a, anywhere from a candy bar to a video game, something like that would be a misdemeanor. Whereas stealing something over $100 in Florida is known as grand theft. And that would be, um, that would be a felony. So stealing something even like an, a cell phone would be grand theft and you would be facing a felony charge. Even within these two categories of felonies and misdemeanors, there's a whole class of various levels. Um, it goes from class A or class one, all the way down to class six or class F. Each state has a different numbering system. Um, but one through six, A through F, depending on the severity, A or one being the most severe, and then uh, class six or F being the less severe crime. So you could get arrested for petty theft, um, you know, stealing a candy bar. And then even within that, um, that crime, there's various levels depending on, well, did you use a weapon to steal a candy bar? Um, you know, did you break into a place to steal a candy bar? So depending on even the nature of the crime, there's various, various levels. All right, and then a little, synopsis or summary of criminal law. So in a criminal trial, um, we have the person accused of the crime. 
I'm going to unmute some of you guys so you can start uh, participating here. Kristen, um, who is who is the person accused of the crime? What are, what are they called? The defendant. Good, the defendant. Um, the defendant is going to go on trial in front of a judge. And if it's a more serious crime, go in front of a jury as well. But if you steal a candy bar, um, you're not going to have a, a jury. You're not going to have 12 people get called off work to listen to your court case about you stealing a candy bar. So a jury is really reserved for more serious crimes. Um, but during the trial, the defendant is going to um, get sentenced, which means they're going to get a punishment with their crime, uh, for their crime. And in a criminal case, you could either get fined, which means you pay money, or you could get jail time. That's a little bit different than the next type of law that we'll talk about. So in a criminal case, you could go to jail. And yes, for stealing a candy bar, you could go to jail for something as simple as that. That's all up to the judge. So the, if you have a jury, the jury will decide whether you're in, innocent or guilty. Uh, they'll decide your verdict, your outcome of your case. But it's the judge who gets to sentence you, who gets to punish you. Um, if it's, again, a small crime, a misdemeanor, then, and you don't have any jury, then it'll be the judge that decides your verdict and decides what your sentence is, your punishment. Um, all right, so did you, were you guys able to get this next blank space here in the reading? Can you raise your hand if you got it? All right, Cassidy, I'm gonna unmute you. Cassidy, um, who is always the prosecutor? The plaintiff. Uh, that's a good guess. Plaintiff oh. is, Plaintiff is actually a term we use in the next type of law. So I'm looking for something else here. Anybody get this fill in the blank here? Preksha, were you able to get this one? I put government. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, no, that's, that's the right answer. Yep, very good. Um, the government is always the prosecutor in a criminal case. So we have two sides in every court case. Um, so in a criminal case, we have the defendant and we have the prosecution or the prosecutor. So the defendant is the person who did the crime. They're the ones who are arrested. And then on the other side, the prosecution is the government. Um, it's always the government pressing charges against you in a crime. Why is that? Well, because it's the government that arrested you, right? Uh, the government's police officers arrested you and now the government's lawyers are going to prosecute you, try to prove that you're guilty. Any questions about criminal law before we move on to the next main one? Does that make sense about the government being the prosecution? All right, cool. Let's move on to the next main type of law, which is civil law. So I had mentioned before that, yes, people like Judge Judy are actual real lawyers, even though it's kind of silly, it's on TV, so I'm sure, I'm sure they try to make it entertaining, but she is a real judge, and what she does is settle disputes or disagreements between people. Um, you'll see two people arguing in court over something. Um, they could have a, a disagreement over property, maybe somebody let somebody borrow something and they never returned it, Maybe somebody caused <clears throat> some damage to property and they want them to pay for it. Um, and then the fill in the blanks on, on this side are a little interesting. I, I tried to help you out by giving you the first letter of these blanks. Um, but let's go, let's go. What other disagreement can people have here? Looking for two words. First word begins with a P, second word begins with an I. Um, I'm going to unmute Cameron. I'm going to unmute you. Cameron, did you get this other type of disagreement? I put personal injury. Yep. Very good. Personal injury. So what that means is somebody well, injured you. Um, could have been in a car accident that somebody hit you with the, you know, they rear-ended your car and you hit your head or you have back problems now. Um, so you could file a lawsuit or sue them for personal injury, trying to get some 
some money for your hospital bills and things like that. So civil law could be about disagreements, people fighting over things, but it can, but the rule of thumb that was in your worksheet was if it's not criminal, it's civil. So if it's not somebody breaking a law and getting arrested, then it's civil law. So civil law deals with a whole number of different things. And some of the, I don't know, more boring aspects, I suppose, of civil law can be about um, legal documents and you know legal procedures of how things are done. And I wanted two types of legal documents um, in our notes here. One starts with a W and the other one uh, starts with a C. I'm gonna unmute you, Caleb. Were you able to get these other two types of civil law documents? One that starts with a, a W, one that starts with a C? Civil law documents. No. You weren't able to get these ones? Yeah. Oh, all right. Um, Kristen, were you able to get these two? Um, I put down will and contract. Good. Wills and contracts. So a will is something, is a legal document you would fill out in order to um, explain who gets your belongings and possessions if you pass away. So there's a legal procedure to do it. There's a certain legal document to fill out. Um, and then a contract is just an agreement between two different parties. So you could make a contract with somebody doing a new roof on your house. Uh, you can make a contract if you are a famous singer and you're making a contract with a record label. Uh, there's a certain legal procedure and things to do to make sure that these documents are legally binding, which means that you know they're official, that you will be held accountable in a court of law um, for these documents. So for a will, you know, if, if your grandmother leaves all her possessions to you, um, but let's say somebody else in your family takes some of her possessions, technically you could take them to court and um, show the judge of the will and um, the, that dispute would be able to be resolved in court. Or if you made a contract with your roofer and the roofer never finished the job, but you put down a deposit, then again, you could take them to court over this contract. So let's get to our little synopsis here about, um, about civil cases. So the only two fill in the blanks here are the two different sides in a civil case. So who can tell me the two sides in a civil case? Who wants to read that first part of that sentence there? All right, Cassidy. Uh, the plaintiff files a lawsuit against the defendant in a civil court. All right, perfect. Yep, so in a criminal case, we had defendant versus prosecutor or prosecution. Here in a civil case, we have defendant versus the plaintiff. So we always have a defendant, always the person defending themselves who have been accused of some sort of wrongdoing or have been accused of a crime. And then the other side is just known by different names. Um, prosecutor in a criminal case, plaintiff in a civil case. So the defendant is charged with some sort of complaint, is accused of some sort of wrongdoing. So going back to previous examples, maybe um, they did some sort of damage to another person's property. Maybe they caused some sort of injury in a car accident maybe they broke a contract so the plaintiff is going to file a lawsuit against them um, typically there's only a judge in a civil case um, usually no jury there could be a jury if it's a very big civil case i don't know hundreds of thousands of dollars millions of dollars perhaps um, a jury would be involved but typically just a judge um, and unlike a criminal case which you could go to jail for in a civil case, if the defendant loses, they would just have to pay some sort of um, amount of money for any sort of losses or damages. So any sort of money lost or um, 
money that had to be paid for medical bills or property damage, things like that. Now, it is possible that a civil case turns into a criminal case. So it, it could, you know, maybe during this trial, you know, the plaintiff was suing the defendant for hitting them with their car. Um, but then upon further review, you know, it turned out that the, the person had blown through a red light and hit you with their car. So maybe now, maybe it, it turns into a criminal case because, well, they, they broke a law, they ran a red light and then caused injury because of it. So a civil case maybe could lead into a criminal case and maybe they do face some jail time because of their actions. But in most civil cases, you're just paying the plaintiff some money. All right, any, any questions at this point with civil law? I do. Yeah, what's up, Cameron? So you just kind of talked about it, but what's like the turning point? Is it breaking a law? that turns it from a civil into a criminal case, or is it, can it be classified as both at the same time, or does it have to be one or the other? Um, well, it would, whatever the court case is, wherever the court is being held, whatever the issue is, would kind of classify it as civil or criminal, but it, it could lead, as I said, to another court case. So you could have had uh -huh. a civil dispute and you know, actually had you know some sort of resolution, some sort of result in the civil court case, but then um, you know, then the but then the judge decides there was some criminal activity, there was something, you know, that the person broke a law and should be arrested, um, which would lead to a completely separate case um, where the government is now going to prosecute that person for breaking a law. So. Um, so a specific court case would be either civil or criminal, but again, one could lead to another if, uh, okay. if somebody broke a law. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Great question. Any other questions, guys? You can just unmute yourself if you have any questions. No? All right. Well, before we move on to the trial process, I actually want to do a few more things. Um, First thing I want to do is match up some of this vocabulary here. So I got six vocabulary words on the left, and I have some descriptions on the right. Um, is, this, is this thing in the way? All right. So number one, felony. Number one, felony. I'm, I'm gonna unmute you guys. Hi, Chris, I'm gonna have you do number one. Oh, okay. Um, felony is a serious crime with harsher punishments. Yeah, very good, awesome. All right, number two, Cassidy, we're looking for a definition for crime. In action that breaks a law. Yep, very good, letter F. All right. Praksha, I'm coming to you for number three, misdemeanor. Um, misdemeanor, a minor crime with less severe punishments. Perfect, nice job. All right, going down the list here. Caleb, coming to you for number four, defendant. Four is D, in a criminal case, government will always try to put, no, wait, sorry, four is C person who is accused of a crime or wrongdoing. Awesome, very good. Um, and then Cameron, I'm gonna come to you for number five, the prosecution. Uh, in a criminal case, government lawyers try to prove the defendant is guilty. Very good, and then number six, plaintiff would be <clears throat> um, the last one on the list, which Cameron, I'm gonna have you do that one too. Number six, plaintiff. The person in the civil case that accuses the defendant. Perfect. All right. Now, one next thing on the list here to do is I want to kind of compare and contrast uh, civil law and criminal law. So we are going to just talk this out. We're not actually going to write it down or anything. We're going to talk about some commonalities, some things that are similar 
between criminal law and civil law. And then on the outsides here, we'll talk about some things that are different. Um, let's talk about some of the similarities first. Similarities between criminal law and civil law. Go ahead and raise your hand. All right, Cassidy. There are two people like arguing in front of the judge. All right, good. Yep. And we could probably elaborate on that for some of the differences too, right? Well, yeah, we always have two different sides in a court case, and we always have a judge as well. Kristen, what do you got for us? Um, it's they're both court cases for somebody's wrongdoing. Okay, good. So there's either a, a crime involved or some sort of dispute. There's somebody did something wrong. So we could even put defendant in the middle here. There's always a defendant, always somebody being accused. Um, Caleb, Cameron, Preckshaw, you guys got anything for us? For something in the middle here? Something similar between criminal law and civil law? <laughs> Go ahead. Nothing specific for me. I kind of wrote the same thing as everyone else. Okay. All right. So we have judge, we have defendant, we have wrongdoing or crime, we have two sides. Um, we could have a jury in both, however, usually it's in one of the other one of the types. Um, we could put um, fine or money being paid. So def the defendant could have to pay a fine or pay some money. We could put that in the middle. That's in, that's in both court cases. Um, yeah, all right, not bad. All right, let's talk about the criminal side. What are some things that are specifically criminal and not, not really civil? What are some things that, yeah, Preckshaw, go ahead. In the criminal law, the person who accuses the defendant is called the prosecutor, and in the civil law, it's called the planter. Civil law, it's called what? The plaintiff. Plaintiff, all right, very good. So yeah, in, in criminal over here, we could put prosecutor or prosecution, and then civil law over here, we could put plaintiff. All right, very good. All right, what, what, what are some other differences between the two? can go ahead and unmute yourself if you want. All right, Cassidy, go ahead. Um, in civil law, there's no jury, most likely. All right, very good, yeah, in civil law, usually we just go in front of a judge, right? If you ever watch Judge Judy or um, Casa Serrata, um, then there's, just one person, a judge. But in criminal law, if it's a very serious crime, if it's a felony, then most likely we'll have a jury. Anything else? Any other differences? All right, well, on the criminal side, I'd probably list the different types of crimes, you know, felonies, misdemeanors. First of all, I would put that there was a crime, right? Because over here in civil law, not necessarily a crime, there's some sort of dispute or disagreement. Some people are saying, this person did this. No, I didn't do this, you did this. Um, they're arguing over something. So over on civil side, we could put like argument or disagreement or dispute, but over on criminal side, it's a crime. Somebody actually broke a law. Um, let's see, what else could we put? Um, over here in criminal law, we could put jail time prison time, right? That could be your punishment. Civil law, no no jail time, no, no, no prison time, usually just paying some sort of amount of money for losses or damages. Anything else? I think that's pretty good. I have one, one more activity for, uh, for types of law and then we're moving on to the trial process. Quick around a Pictionary here. So tell me what type of law it is I'm just going to go down the list of you guys, and we're going to go one by one. Tell me if it is criminal law or a civil law. Uh, Kristen, we'll start with you. Number one. Civil. 
Civil, Civil law. law. Yeah, very good. We have two people having a dispute or disagreement. Cassidy, number two. Criminal law. Very good. Criminal law. So we have crime scene tape. Um, so we know somebody did something wrong here. All right. Number three, Preksha. Um, criminal law. Number three is actually civil law. So we have personal injury lawsuit. So in a, in a civil court case, <clears throat> somebody is filing a lawsuit or somebody is suing another person. And one thing that they could be filing a lawsuit over is personal injury. Maybe they got in a car accident or something like that. All right, does that make sense? All right, going down the list here, number four, Number four, Caleb, criminal or civil? Civil. All right, very good. So remember, the, the general rule of thumb is if it's not criminal, then it's civil. Does a four look like anybody did anything wrong? No. What four is a picture of is adoption. So adoption would be a type um, of case that would be involved in a civil court. Um, and it would actually fall more specifically under the category of family law or juvenile law. Again, there's a whole bunch of subsections of types of law. We're just talking about the two basic types of law. So yeah, number four is civil. All right, Cameron, number five. Criminal law. All right, criminal law. Is that your mugshot, Cameron? I hope it not. Like, it looks like you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, terrible joke. Cameron's beard is much nicer than that. Mm -hmm. um, all right, number six, Kristen. Criminal law. Criminal law. All right, and hopefully that's not you either, Kristen. Number seven, Cassidy, finishing out here. Civil law. Civil law, all right, yeah, they're having some dispute or disagreement over money. Um, could be divorce um, that would fall under family law as well um, type of civil law um, who knows what they're arguing over don't argue it's not nice all right moving on to the trial process so if you were to get arrested if you were to get a lawsuit filed against you you would go to a courtroom something similar like this um, this is a pretty good picture to show us all the different um, parts of a courtroom and the people involved. Um, we're gonna talk about some of the various people on this next slide on our first section of notes. And then I'm gonna kind of flip back to this picture to kind of point them out, kind of give you an idea of where they might be sitting in this courtroom. So number one, a judge decides questions brought before a court. So the judge is sitting up front here. I like to think of the judge as the referee, the umpire, the, the rules keeper. He's, he's the one that's keeping order in the court. Um, he's the one that, he or she is the one answering questions. If the lawyer is confused or if the jury's confused about a law or how it applies to the court case, um, basically the, the judge is making sure everybody plays by the rules. Now, if there is only a judge in a court case, if these people over here aren't involved, talk about those people in a second, but if the judge is the only person involved, then the judge will decide if somebody's innocent or guilty or decide if somebody did some wrongdoing. Um, and they will also sentence the person to a punishment. All right, going back to here, number two, we have a court clerk. So the court clerk, I like to think that of them kind of like the secretary in a courtroom. They're gonna give the oath to jurors um, and also to um, witnesses. So you may have seen that in uh, movies or show, right? You know, raise your right hand, do you swear to tell the truth? Nothing but the truth, so help you God. So that's a court clerk giving the oath um, to jurors and witnesses. Um, and they're responsible for all the paperwork or evidence. So they're probably sitting right here, right next to the judge. Um, they will handle all the evidence that the lawyers present. 
Um, and again, they're kind of like the secretary for the courtroom, the secretary for the, the judge. Next up, we have the bailiff. The bailiff is gonna really keep order because they're like the police officer in the courtroom. So if somebody is out of order, the judge could order the bailiff to remove the person from court. You could even get arrested for being disorderly in a courtroom. That is against the law. So if you don't follow the, the judge's rules, the bailiff could, could arrest you or kick you out of the courtroom. The bailiff will also bring the witnesses up to the witness stand and the bailiff is in charge of the jury. So the jury sits over here. The jury is going to leave and enter the courtroom through this side door. The bailiff typically stands right here. Again, kind of in between the jury and the judge. Um, again, making sure everybody is staying orderly and also protecting the jury. So when the jury leaves the courtroom, the bailiff is going to escort them out. The bailiff wants to make sure that nobody's trying to influence the, the jury, um, make sure that you know, no one's trying to hurt or harm the jury. So the bailiff will be in charge of the jury. Number four, we have the court reporter. Some of you guys are good at typing things real fast. You could get a job as a court reporter. They type everything word for word that is said in a trial. Wow, that's a lot of words and I have to type it really fast. So they are one of these desks. I'm not sure which one, um, but they're gonna be typing probably right here, probably typing or actually this often is their desk on the side here. So this might be where the court clerk is over here, this little side desk, that might be the court reporter. They're typing everything word for word, um, unless if the judge orders that something be removed from the records. Um, maybe some sort of test witness testimony was deemed unfair or something and the judge might tell the court reporter to remove it from the records. Number five, we have the lawyers. The lawyers are law professionals and they, are, they represent both sides of a court case. So we have lawyers that represent the defendant, the person accused of a crime or some sort of wrongdoing. Then we have lawyers on the other side too that could represent the plaintiff um, and then the prosecution. So in a trial, we have one side here, another side here. Um, so again, in a trial, if you are a defendant, you are gonna have a lawyer helping you. You could defend yourself, you could not have a lawyer, but unless if you know all the rules and laws by heart and know how they apply, I probably don't recommend doing that probably a good idea having a lawyer to help you. And if you do get arrested in the United States and you don't have money for a lawyer, um, it's, a, it's a legal right to have a counsel or a lawyer, some help, some guidance. So you could have a public um, defense attorney that could, that could help you out. And then on the other side, again, in a criminal case, there's always gonna be um, prosecuting lawyers. So those are lawyers that work for the government. They are prosecuting attorneys. Their whole job is to try to prove criminals guilty. Um, but in a, in a civil case, there might not be lawyers involved, but for bigger civil cases, I would assume both sides would want to get a lawyer involved to help them to try to win that civil battle. And then finally, number six, we have a jury. It's a group of random citizens who gets called into a courtroom. Um, they're interviewed by the lawyers and then uh, usually a group of 12 in most trials will be selected. So they're over here um, and the jury gets the wit, they get to uh, hear the witness testimony and they get to view the evidence and they're the ones who decide if somebody's innocent or guilty. So if a jury is involved, it's not the judge who decides if you're innocent or guilty, it's the jury. What the judge would then decide is your punishment, um, what you should be sentenced to if you are indeed guilty. One other thing I wanna point out that's not in our notes are these people out here. Um, out here, we can see some pews or some benches. Um, in a court case, it's open to the public. In fact, in the constitution, it says that all trials 
um, shall be public, <clears throat> which means that technically if you want to walk down to, not walk down, that'd be a far walk, but if you wanted to go down to Lee County Court in downtown Fort Myers, and you wanted to go sit in a courtroom and listen to a trial, um, you're more than welcome to. Um, so maybe you're interested in maybe being a lawyer or a judge or just interested in the judicial system. Um, all trials are open to the public. The reason why we have them open to the public is to make sure they're fair and honest, right? Imagine if you were a defendant, you get arrested and you go in front of a judge behind closed doors, nobody's allowed to see what's going on in there. Doesn't sound like the most fair atmosphere or environment. So we have trials open to the public to try to keep them fair and honest. Mr. Burkett. Yep, go ahead, Kristen. Um, I assume this is like correct, but is there like an age, a specific age where like you can't go there? Like to be, <clears throat> to visit? No, yeah. every, everybody's allowed to. I'm sure if a three-year-old walked in there by themselves, they would have some questions about that. But uh, yeah, no, you, everybody's allowed to go in. Okay. Yep. Yep. And I've, I've been one of those nerds who have, you know, have nothing better to do on a Saturday or let's go down to the courtroom. Um, it, it's kind of interesting um, to, to kind of see how, how, it, how it works out. Most um, court cases you're going to be sitting in on are, aren't all that interesting. Or, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Any other questions before we move on to the steps in the trial process? This might be where you have more questions. All right, we're gonna move on to the steps in the trial process. So I'm gonna call on you guys to fill in some of these blanks for me. Step number one, Preksha. The first thing that needs to happen is selection of a- Jury. Yeah, first we need to have a jury. If the trial calls for it, again, stealing a candy bar, we're not gonna call people off of work to be interviewed and selected for a jury. So this is for more serious crimes and more serious civil disputes. But um, people are randomly selected um, through a letter in the mail. Uh, you have to be a citizen. So random citizens, 18 and older, get a letter in the mail saying, come on down to the court. You could get selected to come down to the county court, which would handle smaller misdemeanors and traffic offenses. You could get called down to maybe a federal court, which would be, you know, uh, trials involving people who broke a federal law. So that may, those may be bigger crimes. Um, but you're called down to a courtroom, you're going to be interviewed by lawyers. And so both sides lawyers get to interview all the jurors to make sure that they're not biased. Um, maybe the court case is about um, domestic abuse, maybe a, a a wife and husband getting into physical altercations. Maybe when they interview you, if you grew up in a house that had domestic abuse, maybe if you were involved in domestic abuse, if you were, if you have any connection to this court case, the jur the lawyers don't want you because you're gonna be biased in one way. Um, so they want to try to get a jury that's very fair, very honest, and unbiased. And the juror's role in a court case. Our next blank space here, Kristen. Um, the juror's role is to listen to the opening statements. Not the opening statements. Yes, they they will. Oh, did you did you jump yeah. ahead? Oh, okay. Yeah. Juror's um, role to listen to the evidence. The evidence. <laughs> yeah, very good. Um, so, evidence in a court case could be a few different things. Physical evidence which are like, you know, the weapon at the scene of the crime or fingerprints or video surveillance footage. Um, and then there's also witness testimony, people who saw things um, who are going to testify or give their statement under oath in a court case. So the jury listens to that evidence and it determines whether a crime was committed. All right, Kristen already hopped to number two for us. Step number two are opening statements. Um, each side lawyer, each side's lawyer will give the jury some facts, some introduction to the court case. 
kind of set up the court case for the jury, you know, this is what you're going to hear from us. This is why you're going to find the defendant guilty because we have this, this, and this evidence um, in this court case. It's kind of like your, if you think of an essay, uh, the opening statements is like your introduction, right? It's the introduction paragraph you're putting, you know, your, your statement, your thesis statement, you're putting your main point that you're going to further explain in the body of your essay or in step number three. Step number three, Cassidy. Um, testimony of a witness. Yes, were you raising your hand to, to fill that in or yeah. you have a question? Uh, I have to go. All right. Okay, thank you. I'm yes. gonna watch the video afterwards. So. See ya. Thank you, bye. All right, testimony of witnesses and evidence. So witnesses, again, are people that, that see things and then we could have physical evidence as well. So in a, in a trial, who presents their case first? The blank slash blank. Kristen, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, I think it's the plaintiff uh, slash uh, prosecution. Yep, very good, awesome. So the plaintiff prosecution, prosecution presents their case first. Um, the prosecution is known as having the burden of proof, which means they have to prove that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so you may have heard the phrase, you're innocent until proven guilty. Well, the plaintiff and the prosecutor, again, have this burden, they have this difficult situation that they're in, they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt <clears throat> that the defendant is guilty. So the plaintiff prosecution presents their case first, all of their witnesses, all of their evidence, and then the defense will present their case next. If they have some witnesses to call, uh, there's two different vocab terms I want you to know here. So let's say the prosecution says, you know, the prosecution would like to call Cameron Shelton to the stand um, to testify under oath. So if the prosecuting lawyers call a witness to the stand, and ask them questions, this is known as what, what Cameron, direct? Evidence, or examination, my bad. All right, very good, direct oh. examination. So the, the prosecution would call Cameron to the stand, question them in direct examination, and then when they don't have any more questions, they say, no more questions, Your Honor. They take a seat, but Cameron can't sit down yet because now the other side's lawyer, the defense lawyers can ask that same witness questions in what is called, what is this called? So the prosecution called Cameron to the stand, but now the defense lawyers also get to question Cameron. Caleb, are you able to get this? What is it called when the other side's lawyers get to question that same witness? Cross-examination. Cross All right, very good, Caleb. Yeah, cross-examination. So, so prosecution called Cameron to the stand to question her. They had no more questions. Now the defense gets to cross-examine that witness. And then actually, there's a third step that's not in our notes. It's called redirect examination. So it gets to go back to the original side, it's lawyers, one more time. So the first lawyers, direct examination. The other lawyers get to cross-examination. Then it gets to go back to the first lawyers for redirect examination. But again, we didn't put that in our notes. I just wanted you to know that both sides of lawyers get to question the same witnesses. So after the prosecution calls all of their lawyers, or sorry, all of their witnesses and all presents all of their evidence, after the defense calls all of their witnesses and presents all of their evidence, then we're gonna wrap up this trial with number four here, which are closing, what, Kristen? Arguments. Closing arguments, yeah, very good. And in closing arguments, the lawyers are going to summarize all of the evidence one more time to try to persuade the jury. So steps two, three, and four, 
I like to use the analogy of an essay. If you know how to write a really good essay, step number two, opening statements, is like your introduction. You set up the trial for the jury. Let them know what you're going to talk about. Let them know why you're going to win that case. Step three, testimony of, of witnesses and evidence. This is the main part of the trial. This could take days, weeks, months. Some cases could take years um, for step number three to go through all of that witness and evidence. Um, so that's like the body of your paragraph or of your essay. It could be paragraphs long right? You're really explaining in detail, getting all of the evidence. <clears throat> and then step number four, closing arguments. That's like your conclusion. That's like your, your, your paragraph at the end of your essay, wrapping everything up, hitting on all the main points one last time to try to convince the jury. Then what's going to happen is that the judge is going to give the jury instructions. So we have jury instructions right here. The judge is going to inform the jury of what laws they need to consider. Uh, they will actually read from uh, the code of laws or the penal code of what the law is um, and really make sure that the jury understands um, what, you know, would, what would deem a guilty verdict or a not guilty verdict. And then the jury is going to go back and deliberate. Deliberation is the jury discussion. So the jury goes back into a private room and gets to deliberate or talk about what they think, uh, whether or not the person is guilty or innocent. Um, eventually, which this could take hours, days, weeks, again, this could take a long time depending on the case, the jury needs to come to a unanimous decision. They all need to agree on a verdict. V-E-R-D-I-C-T, a verdict, is a decision whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty. And in order to find a defendant guilty, the jury really needs to have no doubts. Like, I, if there's any doubt in your mind, like, yeah, I'm like 95% sure this person's guilty, but, you know, there was that one piece of evidence that didn't really line up or that one person's testimony I just I'm not 100% positive. If you're not 100% positive, you cannot find the defendant guilty. So you have to be found um, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. You don't have any reasonable doubts that they're not guilty. Now, again, I told you that most, in most states, you need a unanimous decision. Everybody needs to agree. What happens if there's one person out of the 12 that, don't, that doesn't agree? Even after weeks of deliberation, they still are not convinced with the other 11 jurors. Well, what would happen is they come back and they tell the judge that they couldn't make a decision. And this would be known as a hung jury and it would be deemed as a mistrial. All of that work, all of that, all of that testimony, all of that evidence, all of this, the lawyer's hard work. And at the end of the, at the, end of the trial, this trial is going to not even count. Now, what would happen if you have a mistrial and a hung jury, so you have to get a new jury, go through this whole process all over again to, to have a, a brand new court case, which takes a lot of time and a lot of money. So what would happen in a lot of cases is that two lawyers would try to come to an agreement, say, look, we don't wanna do this all again. Look, we have a lot of evidence on your person, um, but." We, we're willing to, to negotiate with you. How about we give you a plea deal, a plea bargain? So how about your defendant pleas or says that they are guilty to a lesser crime? That way we don't go through this whole process again and your defendant only does you know, a few years in prison instead of 10 years in prison. Um, so the lawyers are gonna try to do that plea bargaining to try to avoid a whole nother trial. And actually, from the beginning, lawyers will try to <clears throat> plea bargain to even avoid this. A, a, a trial is very time consuming and costs a lot of money. So even before this all begins, they try to avoid it. Any questions about the steps in the trial process? You can go ahead and unmute yourself if you do have any questions.
How often does the hung jury happen? Um, that's a wonderful question. And I would not like to give you a made up answer. I don't know. Uh, as, as, as far as like percentage wise, how often does that occur? That's a great question. Um, hopefully, hopefully Google can find the answer for you. Um, if I had to go with my gut instinct, I would say that it doesn't happen a majority of the time. It does not happen very often. Um, again, most, a lot of trials um, don't even have a jury. So the judge gets to decide innocent or guilty, um, you know, for smaller crimes. It has to be a very serious crime. It has to be a very serious civil case to have a jury. So most, uh, the vast majority of cases will go through without even a jury. So I, I would guess that it's a very small percentage, but I don't, I'm not really sure what that is. Great question. Any other questions? None? All right, cool. Let's uh, wrap things up for the day, guys. Let's do a little closure activity, some questions. Um, I'm going to just let you guys unmute yourselves and answer so we can go through this as quickly as possible. Number one, what are the two sides or the two parties called in a criminal case? What are the two sides or the two parties called in a criminal case? Go ahead and unmute yourself and answer in. Yes, Caleb. Def defendant and prosecutor. Very good. Awesome job. Number two, what are the two sides or the two parties called in a civil case? Crackshaw? Plaintiff and defendant. Very good. So we always have the defendant. In a civil case, we have a plaintiff, though, not a prosecutor. All right. Now I want to see if you guys could figure out what type of case this is. So, so Based on the name of this court case, Mr. Berkwit versus Board of Education of Lee County. Based on that name of that court case, do you think that would be a criminal court case or a civil case? Mr. Berkwit versus Board of Education of Lee County. What do you think? Civil. Chris, and you think civil? Yeah. Why, why did you pick civil? Um, well, it was because it's a, the Board of Education, so I thought it was more of like some something that you did wrong during like teaching or something. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, so we have two different parties here. It doesn't really sound like the government's involved. So um, this is a civil case. Here's another way that you could figure this out is when you made that landmark Supreme Court case chart, when I... Up in the heading for court case name, the name of the court case, in parentheses, I put that every court case is labeled with the plaintiff or prosecution first and the defendant second. So like Marbury versus Madison, Marbury was the plaintiff and M Madison was the defendant. So in this court case, Mr. Berkwit, myself, I would be the plaintiff and then the Board of Education would be the defendant. So it looks like I'm filing a lawsuit against the Board of Education for something. I'm actually, I'm actually the plaintiff in this case. So using that logic, let's go to number four, State of Florida versus Mr. Berkwit. Is that a criminal case or a civil case? Go ahead, Caleb. Caleb, you criminal criminal case. Yeah, very good. How'd you figure that out? Because the state's after you. Yeah, the state's after me. It's not. It's never good if you have the uh, the state government after you. Um, so in this court case, I broke a state crime, or sorry, a state law. I committed a a crime in the state of Florida. Most crimes that we think of are state laws. So theft, um, murder, um, you know, battery, abuse, all of those types of crimes are actually breaking state laws. So you'd have the state government after you. Now, if you broke a federal law, a US law, like an immigration law or counterfeiting money, something like that, something big, 
Um, now you'd have the, <laughs> the United States government versus you. Um, so they would be the United States versus Mr. Berkeley. So in this court case, I broke the state law. All right, number five, anybody wanna share out their answer to this? What do you think is the most important step in the trial process and why do you think it's the most important? All right, Kristen, go ahead. Um, I thought it would either be um, testimony of witnesses uh, and evidence or opening statements. I mostly go towards testimony of witness and evidence because of like their point of views on the case and like yeah. what they're bringing to the judge, so. Absolutely, I mean, yeah, if you don't have any evidence, if you don't have any witnesses, you don't have much of a, a case, right? So yeah, that is a huge part of the court case because remember, the prosecution, plaintiff, they need to prove that the defendant is guilty of some sort of crime or wrongdoing. So they need to, they need witnesses, they need evidence or else court case is never gonna go anywhere. So you can make an argument that a lot of these steps are important. The jury is really important too, right? Selecting a really good unbiased jury is really important. Obviously the, the verdict, the deliberation of the jury is important because they need to come to a decision who knows, you can make an argument for any of those steps. Let's move on to number six though. What is the, what's the whole purpose of a trial? Go ahead and unmute yourself if you wanna, if you wanna answer it. What's the purpose of a trial? Preksha? To prove the defendant guilty. Yeah, it's uh, to, to to prove whether or not somebody committed a crime or it's to resolve a dispute or a disagreement, right, in a civil case. Number seven, what can you do if you are unhappy with your trial? So if you lose your court case, you, what could you do? Um, let's say in the court case, the judge tossed out some of your evidence because he didn't think it was um, relevant or he <clears throat> dismissed one of your witnesses because they didn't think the witness is being true. If you're unhappy with your court case, what could you do? Kristen? Um, so I've seen like one of these cases before, like where if like somebody lost, but they like kept fighting because they thought it was unfair on how the judge, like they thought the judge was biased. Yeah. So, yeah. What he did was he put his own evidence that from like that he had and he brought it to the judge himself. So that's it. Okay. Um, I'm actually looking for a vocabulary term that we've talked about in this unit. So I'm looking, I'm looking for Caleb, you got the answer? Appeal. Yeah, there it is. You could appeal your court case. And to make an appeal is to make a request to the next highest court to review the court case. Um, so if you're at a Lee County Court, you could appeal up to a uh, to the Florida Circuit Court, next level up, and they could review your court case to see if there was any mistake or anything wrong or about your court case. And then that higher court could either change the decision um, or they could tell the lower court to redo the trial, or they could just reject your appeal and say, nope, sorry, you're, you're stuck with your, with your outcome. Number eight, what is it called when a court has the authority to be the first to hear a case? Kristen? Original jurisdiction. All right, so our last part of this unit is gonna be looking at the the various levels of courts in the state of Florida and our federal court system, the US court system. And we're gonna learn that various levels of courts have original jurisdiction over different types of cases. The lowest level of court, the county courts, like Lee County Court, downtown Fort Myers, they have original jurisdiction over traffic offenses and misdemeanors. So we'll talk more about that um, next week when we look at the different levels of courts. 
And then number nine, what is it called when a court has the authority to review cases that were already heard at lower levels? Caleb? Uh, uh, no. Judicial review. Uh, that's a good guess. Not, not judicial review. So judicial review would be um, the court not reviewing a court case, they're, they're going to be reviewing a law or an action to see if it's constitutional. But if a court is reviewing a court case from a lower court, what is that power called? Cameron, do you know what that power of the court is called? After the jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a hard one. Here, say this appellate jurisdiction. Appellate. Okay. Yeah, there, yeah, there you go. Um, very good, appellate jurisdiction. So a higher court that has the power to review a court case from a lower court, then that it's, they have appellate jurisdiction. All right, guys, again, next week, we're gonna finish up our judicial branch unit with the federal and state court system, looking at the four different levels of courts in the state of Florida and the three levels of courts for our US or federal court system. Any remaining questions before we go today, guys? All right, well, I really appreciate you guys joining me today and asking all those great questions. Thanks for participating. I hope some of that review was good too and beneficial so you better understand it. Um, if you guys have any remaining questions, feel free to hit me up on Edmodo or visit me on a live Zoom. Adios.